All right. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for International Studies panel discussion on defining success and mapping the road ahead for public private partnership and critical infrastructure cybersecurity. I'm Sean Atkins, the host for the event and a PhD candidate here in MIT's political science department, where I co lead a research project on this topic with Professor Chap Lawson. So if you've taken the time to register and join us today, it's probably not news to you that critical infrastructure cybersecurity is a topic that gets a lot of attention. And while some of this attention borders on or maybe sometimes crosses the line into the realm of alarmism, there is real reason to take critical infrastructure cybersecurity seriously. Among a growing number of incidents, the US has already seen foreign cyber operators conduct significant disruptive attacks on its financial services sector and virtually place themselves at the controls of some electricity distribution points. Last year's National Intelligence Threat Assessment noted that some cyber actors were postured to disrupt US national ga uh, natural gas pipelines for a period of weeks, and others were mapping out a number of other critical systems in order to be able to cause substantial damage. The trend line in terms of both scope and scale of threats suggests that this really isn't going to get any easier for us from here. And to address this increasing risk, the US has largely relied on a public-private partnership approach since at least the late 1990s. And this makes sense considering that the vast majority of this infrastructure from financial services to pipelines and from the power grid to telecom networks is owned and operated by private firms. Government industry partnership here is not just a good idea, it's essential. But in practice, the public-private partnership approach has evolved significantly over the last 20 plus years, often in response to the continuing flow of emerging threats, realized vulnerabilities, and changes in technology that affect both of these. The result has been a patchwork of policies across and within critical infrastructure sectors. And something that becomes, becomes evident when you take a step back to look at this evolution is that we haven't really established a clear definition of what good looks like. We haven't defined what success is in this approach or how we might tell that we are getting closer to it or missing it altogether. And to be clear, there have certainly been significant successes as well as instructive failures along the way that indicate where things are working and where they are not. These offer insight that might be leveraged to, to sketch out a usable definition of success that can guide policy, something that gets us beyond broadly conceived ideas of information sharing and cooperation between firms and with the government. So, this is a critical conversation to have and one that has been long in the making. It is also a conversation that I think today's panel is uniquely equipped to contribute to you. Many of you probably recognize some of the panelists and if you take a look at their bios, which will be posted in chat here, you can see that they bring to the table deep experience on this issue in both industry and government, as well as in practice and policy. I'd also like to highlight that they have individually worked on different sides of the fences for this issue, personally bridging across the different worlds that each have an important part to play in addressing what is truly a multidimensional problem. So from here, Professor Chap Lawson is going to set up and then kick off our panel discussion. And then following that conversation, which should take about 45 minutes or so, we'll open it up for questions. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoy and uh, find the discussion useful. And with that, I'll hand it off to Professor Lawson. Chap, it's all yours. Thanks uh, so much, Sean. And I hope you all won't mind if I uh, share my screen here to give you a sense of what we're gonna focus on today once uh, I stop talking and turn it over to our, our panel. So as, as, as Sean mentioned, the focus is really uh, on cyber threats to continuity of operations and critical infrastructure. Cybersecurity is obviously an enormously capacious term and many people at MIT and elsewhere have lots of opinions on it from different angles. But this is our focus today. And as Sean suggested, we're gonna address three questions. Uh, the, the first is, what is success? So what are we trying to get to in this realm? Uh, the second is, how, how are we doing? That is, now that we know what success is, uh, what, we, what will we rate our, our efforts to date? And then what do we need to improve? Uh, that's, that's the third question. I, sh I should just, uh, I should just say, well, you know, why not dive into three? Uh, well, sometimes it's, as many conversations do, sometimes it's just nice to know where you want to go before we start changing course and making recommendations. So the, the proximate motivation for this seminar from MIT's uh, perspective was that uh, Sean and I have been doing a lot of research interviewing people who are senior executives in the private sector or senior government officials or former government officials on, on all of these questions. And one of the most arresting things that came out of those conversations was how stumped people seem to be at first when we ask them what, what is success? Uh, and they, they came up with some of the questions, some of the answers that you, you see there on the screen. Um, just it, we gave our interviewees monikers. So Jerusalem 2019 was somebody we interviewed who was on the Hill. Uh, and 
and gave us the impression that this was a difficult question and in many ways much more problematic in vexing than uh, similar questions might be in other domains of public policy. For instance, it's not the kind of response one gets if you ask about uh, environmental regulation or labor law protections or something like that. And even getting to something as anodyne as the notion of continuous improvement in relationships between the public and private sectors on cybersecurity took, took a little bit of, of prodding. So, you know, what did we find after we after we did that prodding in among the people who we we interviewed? And I'm, I'm not gonna say that we necessarily agree with any of these conclusions, but this was the what jumped out at us from all of these conversations. Uh, was was the first was kind of acknowledgement that. This is an enormously dynamic environment with a lot of inter interdependencies, both informational and economic. And so continuous improvement would be necessary for us to think we'd ever reached anything like success in cybersecurity for critical infrastructure. And, and maybe also uh, from some people, the notion that just success was uh, an indication that the sector was becoming less likely to fail catastrophically as a result of a cyber attack. But, but that wasn't all that we heard from um, the interviewees. We also heard kind of three sub-definitions of success, uh, I guess. One had to do with firms' capabilities, one with collaboration between industry and government, and the third, perhaps the most important, collaboration among different firms within each industry, uh, including firms who might normally be market competitors. And I won't go through every um, element of, of these sub-definitions of success, but I will just highlight one thing, which is the crucial importance that people mentioned of trust. Trust between private firms and trust between private firms and, and the government for building anything like a successful policy regime. So you know, with that in mind, as by way of background only, uh, let me just turn it over to our panel with that first question. Uh, what, it, what is the definition of success? If you were talking to the next head of CISA, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security, or uh, somebody in a roughly analogous position in the White House, what would you tell them they should be trying to get to in this domain? And I guess let me, let me start out with, with Mark, uh, if I would. Thanks very much. I uh, appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, look, I'll speak principally from a um, uh, from a federal government point of view, being that the Cyberspace Solarity Commission just did a lot of work on this. And we kind of settled on the idea that the first thing the government, the first thing that we had to do, no matter what our final strategic approach was to critical infrastructure and cybersecurity, was that we had to get the, the government organized properly because it hadn't been. But if I was speaking to the CISA director, I'd say, you know, kind of give him three thoughts, him or her three thoughts. First is, get the interagency performance and cooperation consistent and correct. Um, the interagency's inconsistent in how they support it. There's, uh, there's some agencies like uh, Department of Energy that really support the electrical power uh, distribution, uh, production and distribution infrastructure well. Um, financial services is treated well. But like our water industry and its relationship with EPA is not nearly as high functioning. Uh, and the budgets kind of support that. So this problem extends to the Congress as well. Um, so first is get the interagency consistent, uh, consistently evaluating risk across their sector. And, uh, and then principally due to the inconsistency, but also a little bit due to turf wars. So get our interagency uh, performance correct. The second of the three things would be start doing pre-planning to deal with incidents and responses. Now it's, um, you have to have done the pre-planning well in advance of a significant cyber event or critical infrastructure impacting event. You have to have built the playbooks and processes and you have to have done this with the private sector and the state and local governments. And then you have to exercise it the national level kind of tabletop exercises. Um, so, you know, start your planning. And if it sounds like I just described the thing that should have happened before COVID, we did a white paper on just the analogy between COVID and cyber, and they're both really non-traditional national security emergencies. And the failures that most of us have noted at the front end of the COVID response will be replicated in cyber 
if we're not careful. And the third thing is, you know, build resilience into your public private collaboration. So if you have that, you'll have success. And what that means is, you know, you got to have a vehicle for how you react, respond, and recover from an incident. And again, that's continuity, what we call continuity economy planning. We talk about that in a future question. But I'll tell you, get the interagency right, start your pre-planning, build resilience in your public private collaboration. To me, that's success from the federal government's point of view. That, that's terrific. And did, Mark, do you just want to add anything about the structure of the cyber solarium and, and the, uh, the report? Maybe we could send a link to the report out in the, in the chat as, as well. The report was set up in the FY19 National Defense Authorization Act by uh, then Chairman Senator John McCain, who was my boss. I worked for him on the Armed Services Committee at the time. Um, he didn't like commissions, but he used commissions when you had a wicked problem that the executive and legislative branch couldn't solve. But so when he authorized his commission, he gave us two things. First, he said, you got one year from when you start to when you're done. And we took one year to fit, we took 10 months to finish our report. And then since then we've been extended, but just to do legislative work. The second thing he did was give us four legislators, two senators, two congressmen, Senator Sasson, Senator King, Senator Representative Landry, Representative Gallagher. And they, and having active legislators means it was fairly, wouldn't say it was easy, but it was manageable for me to get a lot of our recommendations into law. So we had 82 recommendations. We came up with a strategic approach to defend ourselves uh, against the uh, uh, defend our national critical infrastructure, democratic institutions, defense innovation base against a significant cyber attack. And then and McCain also said, hey, don't just give me a strategy. I want legislative and policy remedies, heavily biased to action, which means legislation. So we came up with 82 recommendations, 52 were legislative in nature, 30 are for the executive branch alone. Of the 52 legislative ones, a few, about 15 we are for a future year when a little more work's been done on them. I tried to run 36 into the National Defense Authorization Act, 29 made it into the final conference and 25 are in this final bill. So we actually got 25 laws. Um, I would describe this National Defense Authorization Act as the most comprehensive cybersecurity legislation this country's ever passed. Now look, this our CSC stuff's just a plurality. It's not even a majority. There's about 79 cybersecurity related provisions. Some of the really big ones are ours, like National Cyber Director, which I know we'll talk about in a bit. But the NDAA really, um, I mean, the commission set up by the NDAA, then use the NDAA to get things done. We'll do it again next year, and then we'll expire uh, completely. But the whole idea is to get legislation into action and be biased that way. That's terrific. Joel, let, uh, let me see if you want to weigh in on the first question or anything else that Mark said. Yeah, I... I... I want to begin by saying that um, the Cyber Solarium report is an extraordinary document that everybody who's interested in this area should study closely. We've never had anything like it. And the chairman, Senator King and Congressman Gallagher and Mark, having led this study, really um, everyone, the, the republic is in your debt. Of course, the hard work now is going to be to make it effective, to put it in place. But as for what we should be aiming at, I want to inject a different note. Um, we, notice how procedurally oriented all the suggestions so far have been, and, and on your slide too, chap. Um, measuring oneself against how one used to be is a recipe for deception. If it were good enough, General Motors would never have gone bankrupt because as measured against themselves, they were continually getting better, but as measured against Toyota and Volkswagen, they were continually getting worse. So I think we need to really think about the state of affairs we wanna be at. And I believe there are five elements to that state of affairs. And that this question shouldn't be as hard as many people think it is. First, an attack on our critical infrastructure would fail either in the sense that it wouldn't get through, that it could be uh, dealt with very quickly and without significant consequence and would be punished. Second element, IP theft would also bring punishing consequences in terms of trade, which would require that the TRIPS agreement under the World Trade Organization, which was a pre-World Wide Web agreement, which is terribly obsolete, would have to be uh, significantly um, amended and brought up to date to make that happen. As of now, um, it, every country needs to have rules against IP theft 
in its own country, but stealing IP from another country is not a violation of the World Trade uh, Agreement. This is, is insane. Third, cyber crime would be held within tolerable limits. I don't say eliminate it any more than we can eliminate automobile theft, but in, in, in tolerable limits. And then that would require at least two major things, one of which the Solarium Report deals with, and that is that bots would be readily identified and taken down. We can do that now, but we're not doing it. The second element would be much better cooperation with the CIS states, that's to say Russia and its uh, close allies. I see no prospect of that in the near future. Fourth element, liability for defective goods. Now that could be defined in a lot of different ways, but the Solarium Report also um, uh, suggests that. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of that now, but liability is an important driver of behavior in a capitalist economy, in a market economy. And right now, this is the only area that I can think of in which introducing knowingly defective goods into the stream of commerce has no liability consequences. It's not a government regulation problem. It's just a general liability issue. It's very strange that it's the way it is. Fifth, we would have effective standards, partially through regulation, partially through um, government dissuasion over areas of critical infrastructure. Now, I noticed that the Solarium Report introduces a new term in regard to critical infrastructure called systematically critical infrastructure. Mark may want to comment on this. I think it's an acknowledgement that our current definition of critical infrastructure, which includes, I think, 17 sectors, is, has become so broad as to be nearly meaningless. And this is an attempt to, to um, sort of tighten that down a little bit. But that's what, the, that's what success would look like. If we had those things, gee, we'd be out of work. Uh, that would be great. This is not a, these are not procedural definitions. These are actual aspects of, of, a, of a new world that we'd all like to live in. That's my answer. That, that's great. And I should say, before I turn it over to Larry, it, it's boring if we all agree. So if, if you have strong objections, I, 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 you know, I hope you'll weigh in. I don't think there. that's not a group you have here. <laughs> so is, is that a lead in for me, uh, Chappie? Uh, that, that was. <laughs> and, and now for something completely different. <laughs> Uh, so my remarks uh, emanate from the uh, premise that we are getting killed uh, in cybersecurity. Um, we have started a, ISA has started a program uh, uh, called Rethink Cybersecurity. Uh, we think we need major change. We need major structural change. We need major uh, substantive change. We need major attitudinal change. I'm going to get to some of those things later on. Um, but I want to start by kind of going to Chappie's question, which is, um, you know, what, uh, what would success look like? So in cybersecurity, we begin with risk assessment. So I think that success would look like us finally developing a cybersecurity strategy that is in some rough way equivalent to that of our adversaries. And I'm thinking specifically here of China. We need to develop a cybersecurity approach that is roughly equivalent in thoughtfulness, in comprehensiveness, in integrated nature, and in, in support as our uh, friends in China have developed. They have developed uh, over a period of years uh, a sophisticated digital strategy. The cyber strategy is woven into that. They are thinking of this in much broader terms. One of the problems we think we have with this is we are making no progress because we are thinking of the entire thing far too narrowly. Our Chinese colleagues have not done that. The Digital Silk Road, which is a trillion dollar program, is combined with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and is designed to frankly fundamentally reorder the post-war uh, uh, Western-based uh, system of, of process that we've been under, and they are making some real success, which I'll cover uh, 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 coming up shortly. Um, when I look at, uh, at uh, Dick Clark's book, uh, The uh, Fifth Domain, he makes a very interesting comment. 
uh, wherein he says that we haven't fundamentally changed our cybersecurity strategy since the Clinton administration. Bill Clinton left office 20 years ago. Things have changed pretty substantially in the last 20 years, but I would agree with Clark and Konechny. We have not really changed our policy. Basically, we are doing the same basic things. We're doing standards development and information sharing, and frankly, not a lot more. Uh, we need to be working uh, like our Chinese colleagues have. Uh, they analyzed the digital world. They figured out how first to leverage the vulnerabilities in the digital world, to steal tons of intellectual property uh, and, and jump uh, and leapfrog into competitiveness and even superiority uh, with respect to digital technology, largely by uh, supporting uh, their IT infrastructure much more than, uh, than we have. Uh, so we need, that's what success would look like. Success would look like our being as sophisticated as our adversaries are being, and then we might be able to compete in this space. Now, aside from that, and I'll get to structural change in, later on, um, and, and we have some sympathy, uh, not sympathy, we have support for our friends at the Solarium Commission, but we would go much further. We think it is much, much too narrow uh, an approach. But there are two things that I would say before we get to kind of those policy and structural things. We need attitudinal reform. Uh, we, we need an attitude adjustment. Uh, the public-private partnership has largely been rhetorical in nature. It doesn't look really much different uh, than the other relationships that government have with industry. We need a real public-private partnership. The private sector are not stakeholders to the government. That's how the government really thinks of us. Um, we need to be partners. If anything, the partnership uh, looks much more like a child parent relationship where most in the private in, in the government sector think of the private sector as as uh, as unruly children who need to be disciplined and directed that's not the case um, this is not enron this is not worldcom the problem we have with cybersecurity is not necessarily is not really uh, corporate misfeasance or malfeasance there may be there probably are some uncaring, lazy, greedy people uh, in the private sector. There are probably some of them in the government too, but that's not the problem. The problem we have with cybersecurity is that we have an inherently vulnerable system protecting incredibly valuable data. So long as that remains the problem, um, we're going to continue to have these attacks. We need to understand that the bad guys, the criminals, the Chinese, the, the Iranians, et cetera, et cetera, they are stealing consumer, private information, corporate, intellectual property, national secrets. We're all on the same side. We're doing far much finger pointing. Government points at industry, industry points at government, uh, the vendors point at the users, the users point at the vendors, the media points at everybody. We need to understand we are in this together and we need a much, much more fulsome, equitable structure and partnership to run our digital strategy together. It's got to look much more like a good marriage, not a parent-child relationship. We need to understand each other's unique differences. We need to pull ourselves together and work as a true unity against this massive threat that we are seeing, not just to our critical infrastructure, to our economic way of life and the economic way of life of the Western world. And I can detail that as, as we go on later. Second thing that we really fundamentally need is we need to understand that we are thinking about this still as though this is a technology problem. It's not a technology problem, there's a technical component to it, obviously, but this is not a technology problem. The problem isn't that the technology is bad. The problem is that the technology is under attack. That's a fundamentally different problem. The reason it's under attack is because all the economic incentives favor the attackers. It's not a vulnerability issue. All of our infrastructure is, is vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. Our ground transportation system is vulnerable. Our water system is vulnerable. Our, 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 our agricultural systems are vulnerable. Why do we never read these guys, about these guys being attacked? Because there's no money there. Cue uh, John Dillinger. Why do you attack the internet? Because that's where the money is trillions of dollars worth of money. And we are still looking at this as though it's a technology, technology problem. Now, by the way, when I say we, I'm thinking mostly of our government colleagues. In the private sector, 
virtually everybody in the private sector has done what our government has not done. And I'm credit to the Slyrum Commission because they move us a little bit in that direction, digital transformation. We have not gone through the sort of digital transformation as by the way, the Chinese have that we need to do in this government. We need to understand that this is as much an economic incentive problem as it is a technology problem. We are not going to make the internet invulnerable. Um, we need to work together to come up with economic solutions to this. And by the way, now some people are going to say, oh, the Chinese could do this because they have a totalitarian government and that's of course correct. Okay, our system is not gonna match their system in terms of values. But we have a history of developing public-private partnerships that work effectively without going all the way to an industrial policy. Back after the Great Depression, this is what we did with the Great New Deal. This is what we did in the 1960s when we developed uh, NASA. That is what we did in the 80s when we came up with the Semitech model. We can develop much more fulsome, much more economically sen uh, s sensitive government industry partnerships. And unless we do that, we are not going to achieve this. This is not going to be achieved by having better standards come out of NIST or, or CISA. They're an important part of the problem, but this needs to be approached in a much more fulsome, much more systematic, much more systemic approach. And we have not done that yet. We have some ideas as to exactly how to do that, which we'll get to later on, but thanks, Jeff. Oh, that, that, that's great. And I think since you mentioned NIST, I, I, I got to turn it over to Tony. And I have to catch my breath after Larry's passionate <laughs> defense of his ideas. But um, yeah, a lot of great stuff there. And uh, number one, kudos to to you and Sean. You could have picked a more diverse and interesting panel of folks, I think. Um, and it's just because the ideas are, many of us have been involved with this stuff for decades. So just for background, my, my view is shaped by uh, you know decades as a security practitioner. So I grew up at the National Security Agency, 35 years. Uh, testing for defense is my life. So everything from the mathematics of cryptography uh, up through uh, finding zero days in software to field testing of live, uh, you know, of live operational systems for the DoD. So this is my life, and trying to make sense of it, you know, is what I'm doing at this stage here. And so uh, when we talk about success, I, I'm again I'm more of a bottom up. Uh, practitioner of this kind of stuff, but I think you'll see some linkage to the stuff that Mark talked about, Joel and Larry also here. So when I think about success and you know what what we ought to be aiming for. Um, you know, for me, and I think this matches one of Larry's points. We'll we'll see success when we talk when we talk much less about cyber technology, and much more about risk decision making. I mean, we're seeing a massive shift. I think from you know from our work at the nonprofit Center for Net Security, into the the folk. Everybody's in the cyber business, whether they recognize it or not. Right? Every company executive, every board of directors, every auditor, every regulator, and they're all just trying to make sense of it. And at the end of the day, yeah, we do have a really a, a mismatched uh, problem here of economics. You know, the right things to do technically, whatever they might happen to be, are not the not the things that people are encouraged to do or the, the behavioral issues really bring them to do. And so we, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, do they have these things? Do they have the firewall? Do they have this? Do they follow that? And, and you know, that's in the grand scheme of things, people make decisions for all kinds of reasons, and they're almost never about technology, especially business decision leaders. So let's talk about cyber tech, more about the, how we make decisions the way we do in every other domain of risk in our lives, right? Whether it's public health or safety of a bridge, or the, is it okay to fly in a commercial airplane? We don't ask people to be practitioners. We don't ask them to understand the mechanics of it. We ask them to make decisions, and we provide mechanisms to help them do that. Uh, another, I think, theme that will tell us we're in the right path, I'm sorry, this is a little uh, counterculture, uh, you know, the, the mantra for the last 25 years has been uh, information sharing. When we talk less about sharing and more about sort of what we do with it, right? Sharing is not the destination. It's, it's a means to an end. And the end is so that we know enough to make good decisions. And I believe, you know, in my heart of hearts with decades of experience, the vast majority of stuff that gets shared about threats and attacks and this and that and the other thing out there, most of it is repeats of the same stuff over and over again. And most of it's telling us stuff we already know. We're not managing our systems well, right? With their flaws in our technology. We don't, we're, we're following bad processes. Human beings are getting fooled. I, I don't need AI fancy algorithms to tell me all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's a, there's a need for much better technology than we have today. But the vast majority of what we do today is actually kind of mundane stuff aimed at mundane problems or rediscovering problems that we already know. And that's, that's really unfortunate. Another sign for me of, of a sort of healthy direction is, you know, we, we've grown, I've grown up anyway, in a, 
build it yourself environment. We're going to build security ourselves, right? We buy technology from uh, the vendors. We get a bunch of guidance from this we, and we compose it and we build it ourselves. That, that is unsustainable for most of our economy. That, that'll never happen. There are enough trained people, you know, the sort of build it yourself -er is is a flawed model. Right, it's the way, and many folks have to do it. Most folks won't do it. If you look at small, medium businesses in particular, this is not going to happen. And it's not because they don't care or they're lazy. It's that the capability just isn't there. We need to move much more towards a model of you. You buy it, right? You, it's built into the infrastructure. It's built into the services. And then the role of folks like us, you know, I guess nonprofits. I'm, I've pumped out as much security guidance I think as anybody, except for maybe Ron Ross, you know, from my time at NSA and at the center. But at the end of the day, most of this needs to be built in. And then the role becomes, how do we help people become smarter buyers of security? You know, the way we ask consumers to be good consumers, right? We protect them from certain things through regulatory and laws and codification and so forth and certification of people. And then we have market-driven forces that allow them to make better decisions, not perfect decisions, but better decisions, right? Where there's a, a way for people to operate in society without being paralyzed. And I think so L less of the do it yourself -er, and we encourage that through a lot of different mechanisms, including policy and regulation, more of the, you know, how am I gonna buy it? Uh, the other thing I'll mention that playing off of Mark's uh, uh, comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in federal government, some of the finest human beings, smartest, most dedicated people I know, you know I worked with and, or they're still there, um, but we need a different kind of leadership from the federal government. And some of it, Larry hinted at, you know, this is about uh, this is not about you know government the grand convener grand uh, handing down requirements from on high or bringing out the one big bag of money that you know i, I grew up in the dod so that's the way we think right you know so sort of one big bag of money and everyone will race in to meet my requirements and well you know it's not that kind of thing right everything is too dispersed it's too interwoven with our economy and so you have to see this as a much different kind of role for I mean, we need the federal government and frankly we've been saying you know, all my time in federal government, we need to be a good example. And we're still not there yet, right, uh, for the federal government. We also need to say, my, my advice, you know, and the teams I worked at NSA and if, if uh, have, have followed my work, I was probably as public uh, a person uh, as was at NSA in terms of interacting with this community. Uh, my advice to, to all my employees and to everybody I worked with was, when you show up and you wanna help shape and influence the industry, you show up with content. You show up with draft standards, you show up with ideas, you show up with, you know, you don't show up to convene, you don't show up to organize everybody. The industry, there's lots of great examples of self-organization out there that we need to, I think, mobilize towards more common direction. You know, having spent my last seven years now really in nonprofit space, I, I mean, and I knew this, you know, growing up, I've, I've got 44 years now in this industry. This industry is full of amazing, talented people of great goodwill who share this concern that we're in trouble. And they're willing to put, I mean, the only reason CIS has a business model is because of volunteerism, right? We organize volunteerism. And the, the uh, astounding talent that none of us could afford to hire, even if we find them, that we can marshal towards a common cause. And you can see it in, you know, in our work, but you can see it in the Cloud Security Alliance and OWASP and you know, some of the stuff that Larry's been involved with. I mean, it's astounding, the talent. But we need to organize better, right? And we need to move some of this towards common cause that is really directed, not this sort of, you know, great, we're all saying nice things to each other. We all kumbaya, you know, when we get together at RSA, but we, but we are not really directing ourselves. And some of that, you know, we need, the, yes, we need the federal government. Some of it, frankly, we in industry, you know, uh, nonprofit and for-profit need to, need to get our act together. And I, I think one uh, uh, point of hope for me is that many of us who are, I would consider myself sort of an early generation warrior in this space, most of us are now are towards the end of our careers trying to figure out what, what in the heck have we done in the last 30 or 40 years and what's our last hurrah going to be. And we're scattered all across government and private sector and nonprofits and think tanks, uh, you know, and some examples are even on this panel. You know, we need to do more on our own, right? No, no one's going to come down on the high to solve this. We need to think about how we self-organize the nonprofits, the th you know, all these different great groups that, that uh, come together. Anyway, so that's my, my thinking. It's a little different, again, the view of a practitioner, but I wanted to, to share with you. A lot of these do have connections to policy and the kind of behaviors we encourage. And la last thing is, uh, you know, we have a lot of things that we say in this industry that we say and we all nod, but we don't actually define. <laughs> For us, I think it'll come up later in the talk, uh, cyber hygiene. How many times have I heard, you know, we all need better cyber hygiene, for example, and the simple, somebody will say patching or whatever they happen to say. But if you don't define things, then you don't know how to uh, have a campaign. You don't know how to 
measure progress. You don't know how to negotiate, you know, are you safe to bring into my supply chain? You know, we need, we need to be specific enough to make those kinds of decisions about uh, negotiation and about what I call aggregation. We want to know if a particular sector is getting better and better faster than, you know, whatever the, uh, the benchmark that uh, Joel mentioned earlier. So with that, looking forward to the next question. Thank you. I, I think that's terrific. So you all have heard um, several different definitions of success, although there's some consensus. And I think to put uh, uh, the second question in a slightly more pointed way, I guess we can move through it rapidly. On a scale of zero to 10, I would like to hear how, how far along do you think we are, either using your own definition of success or some hybrid yardstick of what you've heard so far. So, so let, me, uh, let, me, let me start with, with Larry. And I, I'm just gonna take a wild guess that the answer is somewhere below 10. Yeah, uh, I, uh, you know, my friends uh, tell me that I'm the guy who thinks the glass is three quarters full. I'm really uh, an optimist. Um, and, you know, I'm struggling to be able to say we're at 1.5. Uh, I mean, I think we are, and it's not that people aren't doing good work. Everybody around the table here has done probably a bunch of people in the audience. I'd like to think we've done some good work at ISA. Um, but we are, we're getting crushed. I mean, I, I talk to people, uh, you know, and they, I say I'm in cybersecurity, and say, oh, yeah, I hear that's a big problem. And what I tell them is, oh, no, 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 it's much, much worse than you think. Um, and, and it's true. I also, by the way, uh, you know, to kind of get back to a comment that Tony made, which I agree with, um, and I, you know, we're at an academic institution, so I want to make some you know, <laughs> candid comments. Um, I think we really need to cut back on the happy talk. Um, so uh, I go to these conferences, we all go to these conferences and, uh, and uh, you know, I get up and I say what ISA is doing and Tony gets up and says what his organization's doing and you know, we got the supplier and consumer and then the vendors get up and they have, you know, whiz bang new technology. And then I go out into the audience, particularly when I talk to boards and stuff like that, which I do a lot of nowadays. And uh, one of the things I hear from these guys is they say, hey, sounds like you guys got this covered. And I'm like, no, no, we don't have it covered. We are losing and we are losing big. We would have to expand the football field, you know, to figure out how far away we are from the goal line. We would have to double or triple it. We are getting cyber crime. Cyber crime is a $2 trillion, according to World Economic Forum, it's a $2 trillion a year industry now going to six trillion in a couple of years. And that's a conservative estimate. Cyber Magazine just said it'll go to $10.5 trillion a year. Now at two trillion, the cyber criminal nation, if we couple them as a nation, they would be in the G10. They're just a little smaller by revenue and Great Britain and they're probably better organized than Great Britain. And what are we what are we doing? The 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 FBI's budget to track down these this massive criminal, $4.5 million. That's million with an M versus trillion with a T. Okay, How, what, what do we do? We are successfully prosecuting less than 1% of cyber criminals and it has been this way for decades. Everybody in this, on this panel knows we do not have anything close to a functional international framework to track uh, and, and, and extradite and prosecute cyber criminals, and we haven't for decades. I don't recall seeing a single hearing ever on Capitol Hill in the 20 years I've been doing this that focused on the cyber crime problem in that sense, not once. Uh, I talked about uh, the fact that the problem that we have here is the economics of cybersecurity. I, I, I know of one hearing in my 20 years that discussed the economics of cyber. They talked about the economic impact of cybersecurity, but who cares about that? I mean, we all know it's, it's enormous. It's hard to figure out it's so large. We are getting killed. And to go back to my friends, the Chinese, um, I mean, around the, in, in, in Washington, DC, Mark, you can validate that, you know, the big issue of the day, I mean, supply chain is old news now. Of course, everybody's really hot on supply chain. Supply chain was the new black. Now it's 5G. And that's kind of over. We've pretty much lost the 5G fight. The Chinese for years have been building these telecommunications networks in 
Asia and Africa, Latin America, Europe, and their 2G and 3G is Chinese and the 4G and 5G is going on top of that. There's no way they are ripping and replacing this in, 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 as they're fighting the COVID epidemic. And, and Huawei is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I don't even care about TikTok. I'm worried about Baidu and, 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 and Tencent and, and Alibaba and China Telecom. We are facing a massive structural funded adversary. And we are really still mostly talking about information sharing and setting standards. We are not stepping up to the plate. And I do not believe, as I said before, we are not acting like we're married. Uh, <laughs> we're acting like, uh, you know, or, or we're, a str we're in a strange couple. <laughs> it's not a good marriage. All right, Mark, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to you now because I, for one, I know you, you uh, may have to leave early to be called away to something else, but um, where would you put us? Are, are, are you as I'll optimistic? Go, uh, I'll go mathematical. You? I'll give us a one. So that's a, uh, and here, here's the basis. So in 1999, I, or 98 to 2001, I worked for Dick Clark at the National Security Council on counterterrorism and critical infrastructure protection. We wrote PDD 62 on counterterrorism and an associated counterterrorism plan. I would say, Oh, 90 percent of what we asked for has been uh, was has been executed, and then another 90 percent that we hadn't thought of pre 9/11 has been executed. Simultaneously, we wrote PDD 63 on critical infrastructure protection and an associated 1098, an associated national infrastructure assurance plan in 2000. I went back and looked at it when we were doing the Solarium Commission. I, I waited till we were done because I didn't want to you know, kind of just create, you know, go back and refight battles I'd had then. But I would estimate that we've accomplished 10% of the assignments in an IAP. Uh, and even then things like creating, the things we created were, were processes that could help if you uh, substantially, um, you know, if, if everything were going well. So things like the NIAC, I remember writing executive order for that, the National Infrastructure Assurance Council, that still exists. But, you know, we've done about 10%. So there's mathematically where we're at. Um, I do think, you know, we're in a lot of trouble. I, you know, we talk about, I want to pick up on something Tony said, we can't, it is amazing the degree that we can't convince people to do personal computer hygiene. And I'll say what it is. It's multi-factor authentication, complex passwords, and don't answer emails from Nigerian princes. If you can do those three things, your personal hygiene is probably okay. But the, the other one's the business hygiene. And this gets into, does your company use, you know, enterprise or retail registrars? Do you use DNS? Do you use DNSSEC? Do you use DMARC? You know what, you know, there is a 10 point check. And I, I have to tell you the a vast, vast majority of the 85% of our national critical infrastructure that's owned and operated by the private sector does not pass that test. And there's very select elements of our uh, infrastructure that do, the really big banks do. They run and they run op centers that as a you know, retired two star, I would have appreciated that op center as a one star. Um, you know, it, it, it's like my op center, except with comfy leather chairs. You know, I mean, the banks actually have good uh, situational awareness. Now, look, that doesn't prevent all crime. But why are they like that? Because that's where the money was 15 years ago. They've been on a constant attack. The, um, the other thing I would say is, um, look, it's not like the 15 percent that's dot gov and dot mill is passing all those you know, uh, kind of enterprise cybersecurity hygiene tests, I just said, and it's inconsistent in there as well. You know, if uh, if I could mention one other thing, there is a piece, a glimmer of hope on the horizon, and it's not um, that COVID has taught us a lesson. I wish COVID had taught us a lesson about national, non-traditional national security emergencies, but I, I don't think that's happened. The glimmer of hope is ransomware. Contributing significantly to that uh, to that growth, you know, up to not significantly, but contributing to the one trillion in cyber crime is ransomware. What ransomware is doing is it's it's making everyone a bank. It's monetizing data. If you're the you know if you're Prince George's County, and you have and you're running utilities and taxes and billing, and you hold a lot of people's personal information. When someone grabs your system to either prevent you from getting in or to extract information, taking it out, they're monet, you know, in, in return for ransomware, they're monetizing your data. And now you've got to protect it. And, and the reason this is important is our estimate, and I, I'd like to be corrected, I think I'm broadly in the ballpark, 
is that a good cybersecurity budget is one that spends 10 to 12 cents out of every IT dollar on security. But the reality is outside of those banks, you know, it's four to six cents of every IT dollar on IT security. And this is below the critical, using you know, nuclear background, we're now below the critical mass to get any fusion going, right? You know, the when you only spend four or six cents on a dollar, it's, it's, you might as well just spend zero because you've left so many gaps and so many openings. You, you can't possibly have the people and processes in place to do cybersecurity. That number is going to be driven up by ransomware. At some level, it's going, people are going to say, you got me once, I'm going to invest Next time CISO, the new CISO, because you probably fired your CISO, comes around to talk to you about cybersecurity, you know, he or she is gonna is gonna get the budget they need. So in my mind, we're at one out of ten, but there's a few glimmers of hope. All right. D Tony. Boy, this is uh... <laughs> Uh, pessimistic, but all good. All right, let me get, uh, let, actually, in the interest of time, let me just tell a couple of stories that I think will uh, illustrate a position. So many of you know, uh, his name Sean Henry ring a bell with CrowdStrike. So Sean, you know, helped start up the, uh, the, the cyber practice at the FBI and is a well-known guy. Uh, many years ago, I saw him quote in the paper. It was so good, I called him up to make sure he actually said it and I can repeat it with his permission. So he said, must've been 12 plus years ago. Uh, and his quote was, Anyone in organized crime who's not getting into this cyber stuff ought to be sued for malpractice. I mean, yeah, this is what Larry's point was. Right? This is where the money is. They're not going away. And, you know, in fact, it's gotten better. Anyone who doesn't do this as a criminal, uh, in espionage, et cetera, what are they doing instead? You know, why would you run into a bank and pull a gun and put your life at risk, right? And so this is a, you know, systemic, not going away kind of issue. The second quick story is, so my son is in this business now. And uh, he actually has a background in economics. So he's, he's a self-made computer guy now, now working uh, you know, in this space. And he said, Dad, am I, am I too young to get, you know, is it too late for me to switch into this career? You know, I said, no, son, no, no problem at all. I said, it's really clear from everything that's going on that my generation will not solve a single foundational problem in computer security in my lifetime. But so lifetime employment for you, but I need you to get better, right? Because I want my retirement checks to show up every month. So, you know, there's so much to be done yet that has been said in many a report. Uh, Mark gave a great example of, you know, I, and I've been involved in a number of these uh, national commissions and various big studies, both internal to government and outside. And, you know, we're basically returning 60, 80% of the same things over and over again, right? All these, be a good example, you know, fix the economics, clean up the hygiene, all that kind of stuff. So that's the bad news is we got a lot of, a lot of things that really need attention. The, the good news, and I'll give us a four, and uh, because I am a hopeless optimist, because you, you, you can't survive in this business for long unless you're a complete cynic, in which, case, in which case there's plenty of work for you, or you're really an optimist and you believe, and I believe. And, and those signs I mentioned earlier, right, the incredible talent, the people that really care about this kind of stuff, the level of awareness, people are grappling with what to do. I think it, you know, those of us that have kind of grown up as we need to shift our thinking about some of these issues that Joel mentioned and Larry mentioned and Mark, you know, around the economics of this, around organizing the policy of this and getting together. Uh, but, th but the opportunity is there. I think the talent is there. The ideas have been there for a long time. I think there's a recognition that we're at a, a point that really matters and we should do something about this. And again, you know, again, my generation is sort of a, the first that's heading to the end of the cliff here and, and wondering, you know, what is it we can do to leave things better? So I, you know, I have an amazing network of people that, you know, and, and every one of us on this call does that, that we tap for these uh, big studies and all these different ideas and panels and, you know, uh, appearances and so forth, that we really need to do better than the happy talk. We do need to say, what is it we need to do, not what we need to sort of talk about anymore. We've admired this problem for decades. So for me- well, I think I think that's that's uh, where we're headed next, but I did want to give Joel the opportunity yep. to, to, to rate us on a scale of zero to 10. And I, I must say, I would rate higher than everybody else, probably because I'm looking solely at cybersecurity for critical infrastructure, not the whole ball of wax or every possible meaning of the term cybersecurity or term that has cyber somewhere embedded in it. And I guess I would say it, I would say it in four steps. Um, first, there's, there are a very small number of systems and firms that are really systemically important. Um, Second, if, if we protect those, we will dramatically mitigate the chances of systemic failure, which is, to my mind, where the government ought to be focusing its efforts. Um, three, the, the best way to do that is to have more operational coordination between 
the government and industry, which looks a lot like the FSR, the ARC, something like more in a real-time war room situation. And fourth, we already have some models and some sense of, of that's where we're going. So that's why I would give us a five, but Joel? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I agree with you that um, there are aspects of critical infrastructure that have become um, significantly better. And, and that's why I'm not giving us a zero. As a nation, however, I, I think we're failing. And I, I'm, you know, one through five. I'm a pass-fail guy here, and we're failing. Uh, you can quarrel about one or two. I, I think four or five, I think you're on a five scale. I think you're smoking funny cigarettes. Um, the, the, we're failing. Um, I also want to emphasize something that Larry said that's very important. Um, and I want to make sure everybody in the audience understands this. The fundamental problems are not technological. We do have some technological challenges. The fundamental problems are managerial, behavioral, um, econo you know, economic, and, and legal. We, the, the incentives we really look for are positive ones in the, in the form that the tax code, among other things, can deliver. Negative incentives in, in the form of reasonable liability that looks like liability in other sectors of the economy, not, not more than that. Um, and last is regulation. In a capitalist economy, the incentives are the thing that makes the world go around or stops it from doing certain things. Um, there, there, there are lots of things we can do here. Uh, I mean, I, I've disagreed with my fellow panelists in terms of defining what success looks like, because I think we should do it in substantive terms. We've heard a lot about things that every, all of us agree about, which is how to get there. But, you know, information sharing, or th these are not goals in and of themselves. They're, they're ways to get us somewhere. Um, but I think we're, we're doing poorly. We need to recognize it. All right, so let me, let me start the third, the third round, I guess, and we can, we can be, uh, at this point, moving into sort of lightning uh, responses, but Joel, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it once, what what would you change to to make us better? Um, I, I would focus on, on infrastructure and isolating controls and reducing the complexity of components. But again, I think the way to get there would be incentives, both positive and negative, as I've described. Uh, Larry. One word for you, Benjamin, economics. We have, to, uh, we have to fundamentally change the economics of this and we can do. So um, before he left, Mark said, well, uh, ransomware, you know, that's, that's the light at the end of the tunnel because everybody will lose so much. I've been hearing for 20 years that the big one is gonna come and everything's gonna change. I don't think that's gonna happen. Ransomware is going to continue to evolve as our defenses evolve. We need to develop a dynamic system of cyber defense. And that comes when we change the economics. Virtually nobody smokes anymore, as opposed to uh, when my parents' generation, everybody smoked. You know why? It's not because the Surgeon General said uh, smoking causes cancer. They actually already knew that. It's because the economics of buying cigarettes changed so much, and it led to what is the economics that has to change? I mean, I get the sense from Joel that it involves regulation. So, and I get the sense from you that that's not your answer. Regulation is appropriate in certain circumstances, particularly, for example, where the, uh, the fundamental economics of the industry, such as in much of critical infrastructure, is involved in economics. But we would change the form of regulation. That's the important point. The regulatory structures we currently have are these elongated lists of requirements none of which have ever, by the way, been shown to enhance cybersecurity. Read Doug Hubbard's book. He does a great analysis of all of these uh, checklists and finds that, first of all, nobody fills them all out, even the banks. Uh, and, and they don't know whether or not they're supposed to start at one and go to 250 or they could start 250 and go to 500. There's no, the, what we need to do is, is adapt these new, more modern 
methods of cyber risk assessment, things like factor analysis of information risk and X analytics, et cetera, which puts cyber risk in a economic sense so that organizations can better assess what their risk appetite is and then can mitigate down to what their risk appetite is. And then we combine that with the policy that is already in the National Infrastructure Protection Plan with regard to critical infrastructure. The private sector, and this is a disagreement by the way with the Solarium Commission, the private sector is charged with providing commercial level security, not national level security. There is a gap between what is commercial level security and national level security. And it is the public sector's job to provide what it goes above that gap. You can't ask the private sector to continually make uneconomic uh, investments in cybersecurity. They won't we need the economic sectors to continue to work. So we need to evolve a system of incentives and they tax incentives should work for small companies, not for the big guys. For the big guys, there are a wide range of tax of, of non-tax incentives that we already have in the economy, that we have in agriculture and aviation, ground transport. Right. In well, I gotta hear what Mark says because he's still with us. So we yes, what incentives? So I can tell you. But anyway, I can go into great detail. Oh, this is good. No, I think I understand what you're what you're driving, yeah. and it makes sense. And it is, in fact, the alternative to regulation. But since you since you took Mark's name in vain, and he is still with us, let, let me turn it over to you, Mark. Please. Um, well, listen, I agree with with most everything that was said uh, today. Um, the uh, I certainly think it'll be challenging to have the federal government help close that gap. Um, but I do think it's a unique issue. 70 years, we haven't had to defend our critical infrastructure. When you think about any other warfare area, the government owns every plane, every submarine, every tank, every ship, you know, um, so we really haven't had to factor in the private sector. So there is new logic is required. Uh, and we've done new logic before. The Tennessee Valley Authority was new logic, how we re, re authorized the Ford motor plant and into building tanks and aviation in the 1940s was even Semitech to some level was new logic. Um, so, but on the issue, if I had one thing, first, I like all the things that were mentioned. If I only had one thing, I'd take leadership. This is gonna take leadership. You know, this is one reason we created the National Cyber Director was you actually need an empowered, strong, um, I don't wanna call him independent, but you know, someone who has both access to the president and to the Senate and house to make things happen, to be that belly button for the CEOs to come to with problems, who wakes up in the morning and their number one issue is, is cyber. It's not like the National Security Advisor wakes up, his number one issue is S-400s in Turkey, his number two issue is a carrier in the Arabian Gulf. You know, he gets to cyber around number 23. You need someone to wake up number one. If we're gonna prevent a national, a non-traditional national security emergency like COVID occurring in cyber. And I don't know if it'll be a big one or if it'd be a sustained campaign of small ones, but eventually we really, we are losing GDP potential and actual GDP every year. And I believe it's in the trillions, like uh, Larry says, overall. And I think it could be worse if a nation state really turned their, their eyes on us. You need leadership, you know, Rick over like leadership. You know, someone who takes something and and absolutely applies a standard to it, uh, and um, it's going to be very hard to do. Uh, and you know, the battle lines have been drawn for twenty years between agencies and between the private sector looking at the federal government saying you're not providing much. I show up at the table and I hear the same ridiculous briefs every time. Leadership, and so I hopefully take a look at our national cyber director recommendation. Obviously, if you pick the wrong person, if if you don't really really pick the right person, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, and so I hope they identify and pick the right person, the uh, Biden administration, and I suspect they will, um, you know, and, uh, and when they do, uh, I think, you know, that will help change things. It's going to take a lot more than one person, but it's leadership. And I do have to check out, but th thank you very much. I've learned a lot during this chat. We, we should go to Tony. You, you get a chance to wave a magic wand as well. Oh, wow. Well, short answer. I've already hinted at it, and it combines a couple of things. Mark talked earlier about you know, we know there's a list of things that everybody ought to do, whether you call it hygiene or foundational or whatever. You know, what we've done at the Center for Net Security is we have uh, actually defined what I talked about earlier, right? Here's a specific set of things. And, and we didn't just make the list up, right? Most of the stuff that is um, created, all those uh, regulatory lists and checklists and things like that, good people get together and they argue till they come up with a list. But as, as I think Larry might have said, right? So what value does that have against the attacks that are happening? Well, you know, it's good to do. These are good things to do. You know, that's what, that's how we've sort of traditionally looked at this. We haven't, we don't have the kind of data or the modeling 
that we'd expect, you know, to underlie the actuarial science that we have in sort of many other domains. And we're a ways from getting there yet. So what we've done though, is analytically look at what we think is a reasonable and small and foundational set of things, um, bounced it against the best available summarized data of the attacks that are in the, in the wild and modeled that using the closest thing we have to an industry standard. I won't go through the technical details, but the idea is everything that you could do in defense has either some impact or no impact upon the adversary's life cycle, right? Their ability to do reconnaissance, to, to do the first thing, to move around, to exfiltrate data. And so you wanna be able to uh, look at your list of things to do in an analytic way to make sure that it has some specific security value to it. But that's not enough. That's why there's no one thing, even in a lightning round, I can tell you. So we've been working with states, a couple of states now and a number of others are thinking about it to what they're moving to a model is not of regulation, but to incentivize voluntary adoption. That is to offer some level of liability protection or safe harbor. If you, you know, can demonstrably say you are uh, putting in place these practices and they include a reference to the NIST cybersecurity framework and to the work at the Center for Internet Security, right? So you have to kind of combine the specifically what you want people to do with some incentivized way for them to look at that, right? As opposed to this, you know, because as soon as you try to crush it down as a, a mandatory, you know, it's just seen, there's so much back uh, pushback to all that kind of thing. So we're looking at this as a model. It's, it's seen, you know, people have been coming up with this. Uh, people are studying it to see if, is this a more uh, scalable model for at the federal level or other ways. So, so, you know, we have to find a way to address the economics in addition to what's the, the most important technical thing to do. So that's what we're doing at the center. I'd, I'd like to bring Taylor Reynolds into this conversation in a sec, but I, I feel like I didn't mean to cut you off, Larry, so I, I, I should go back to you. And uh, I mean, I, I'm hearing talk about incentives, but I'm not exactly sure of the form they would take. And really, if incentives to the private sector to invest in a higher level of security when we don't know which investments would actually generate security, to me, is not the may not be the best uh, public policy instrument. It might be better to instead insist that the truly crucial firms get together and share information in a small enough group where you could establish some trust and then direct resources in a sort of peer review fashion among those firms. That strikes me as a different model than either the tax incentives, which is kind of a blunt instrument, or the subsidies for larger firms to make checklist style investments. So uh, if you're asking me, uh, we, we, we think that the incentives need to be calibrated to the industry sector. So you need a different sort of incentive in the, in, in the utility sector than you do in the defense sector, uh, than you do in the IT sector. Um, so we look for a menu of incentives and these incentives all ought to be calibrated to really one of our fundamental and most long-standing requests, Tony will remember this from the days when we were developing the NIST framework, uh, the, the, these, these frameworks, these procedures need to be empirically tested for cost effectiveness. We have no idea if the NIST framework helps in terms of security at all. I suspect, by the way, some of it does. I suspect some of it doesn't. And I think some of it is uh, effective, but not cost effective. We, 10 years later, we need to know these things. And then you calibrate the incentives to the cost effective um, uh, 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 mitigation uh, steps um, uh, based on what is good for, the, for, the, uh, for that particular set. That's why when I said at the top, we advocate for the Office of Digital Strategy and Security, which is a much broader uh, approach than uh, the directorship that is in the Slyrium Commission. We think Slyrium Commission, that's a good idea. That's a step in the right direction, but we need something much broader. And part of their job would be to be testing the government programs uh, uh, the way we do in industry. You know, whenever we in inject a program, we test it and then we modify it based on what's going on. We don't do that in government. We should be doing that. And then you apply the incentives based on what is cost effective. If things are cost effective, we shouldn't need to be providing an incentive for it. But if things are effective, but are cost prohibitive, that's when you provide the incentive. And these incentives do not have to be monetary. Uh, there are liability incentives, as Joel has pointed out. Uh, there's insurance incentives. There are procurement incentives. Uh, there are very creative forms of incentive. For example, in, in pharmaceuticals, uh, if you have a good track record with the safety of your drugs, you can get um, uh, to the front of the line a, 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 a fast track to get um, your new drugs uh, improved. We should have an, a situation like that for IoT 
because the problem with IoT is that they just rush this stuff to market so quickly because you got to get to market quick, you know, and if now there was an incentive, a cyber incentive that gets you to the front of the line to get your product to market faster, that's a market incentive that doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't cost any, any money for the federal government, and could actually result in industry itself having a dynamic reason to improve their own security. That's what we are saying. And by the way, one of our proposals that this Office of Digital Strategy and Security would, would enact would be to create a study to define what these incentives are even more broadly than we have here. So no, we're, we're not interested in a cookie cutter approach. We're interested in a very strategic metrics oriented approach. And that should go, by the way, going back to regulation, the regulation should be economics based and very, uh, very much uh, based on research and cost effective. And we can do all this, by the way. And, and it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to do all this. You know, we're not talking about a massive federal program to do studies. <laughs> studies are what we do to kill bills. <laughs> Give somebody a study, you know. We could, we could study the NIST framework and determine, we could have done this 10 years ago. So uh, no, we think there's a lot we can do for very little money um, and with some creativity. And by the way, that's what we're supposed to be good at here in the United States is that kind of stuff. So I think we can do this, but we're not doing it. Taylor? Hi, thank you very much. This has been a this has been really a fascinating discussion, and um, I love the focus that people have put on the economics behind this. I'm an economist by training, and digging into cybersecurity when Joel held his his workshops on protecting critical critical infrastructure about five years ago, I was surprised at how little focus there was on the actual numbers behind these attacks, behind the losses. And it, for an economist, it makes it very difficult for us to make decisions. We have to have some hard and fast numbers to work with. Um, Larry, I loved how you mentioned the economics of cybersecurity over and over that it's not being discussed enough. I'll have to tell you, I was really surprised in talking to CISOs about the losses that they're taking by hitting, being hit all the time with these cyber attacks. When we talk to them, they say, well, we don't really calculate the losses. What we do is we typically have a bucket. We have like the low, medium and the high. And if it's like in the high bucket, then we'll turn it over to the forensic accountants who are working for the insurance provider and they'll figure out how much we lost. But other than that, it's really like, well, we're just getting hit a lot and we don't know what's happening. The problem with that is that then if we try and come up with these numbers like $2 trillion in losses that we heard about, like, where's that number coming from? Because I feel like no one has a clue how much money they're losing. And so when we have a platform that we're, we're doing now to try and put numbers behind how frequently controls are successfully attacked and how much money is lost when they are, when they're successfully breached. So we build a platform to do this. We've run some ca computations using multi-party computation to keep data secure. Um, and we're starting to put some of those numbers there. But one of the difficulties has really been getting the firms to figure out how much money they're losing. And the other side of this is if you are a CISO, you need to convince the chief financial officer, you need to convince the board that they should give you more resources to attack this or that. And they speak the language of dollars, of money and dollars. And the problem is we're just not making that happen very well. Um, I. I just wanted to point out one other quick thing that the, the platform we've built, this SCRAM platform stands for Secure Cyber Risk Aggregation and Measurement. Um, we're running computations with, with very large firms to pull out like what's really happening behind the scenes and getting some numbers on those. Our goal is to be able to empirically test for cost effectiveness. So while we have these different frameworks out there, we wanna be able to test them and say, well, are they capturing the things that tend to be losing the most money? So very interesting. I'd be really interested in your thoughts and ideas of how we can get firms to think more about the actual losses that they're incurring. Thank you so much, Taylor, for, for adding that. I also see a couple questions in the um, chat that I, I want to make sure you all take a swing at. Um, one is from my colleague in um, nuclear engineering, Scott Kemp. Um, who suggests moving the focus away from economic cybercrime, critical infrastructures in ways more important to the life of the nation and might be easier to crack because much of the critical infrastructure can be physically configured to make failures more contained and maybe more rapidly recoverable if we take the right physical steps. So uh, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that in how many different critical infrastructure sectors, truly critical, not just with that terminology, actually critical, 
critical infrastructure sectors? Can we simply build in air gapping and other physical remedies? And then a, a question from uh, Jared Gansel, also here at MIT. Uh, I think it, it might be uh, focused at Tony, but uh, others could, could weigh in. Um, we continually face this challenge of uh, convening public and private stakeholders in the emergency management field in, into productive discussions for systems thinking and making sense of the problem. And have you faced this sort of challenge in cybersecurity? And if so, what have you done that has worked to move the conversation forward beyond what you've already mentioned, Tony? And, and do you have any advice from the cybersecurity world that might be relevant for, say, um, emergency management? Jared also asked another question, and because he's Jared, he gets to, uh, that uh, it's, it, this is probably for Larry, that, you know, that these are sometimes low likelihood events, the prospect of a, you know, a concerted attack by a well-resourced adversary, so that it never really enters into the capital budgeting process for corporate managers. And how do you address that specific incentive? So, so let, me, let me go to Tony first, and then, then, uh, then Larry, then Joel. Yeah, thanks. Uh, a great question. Yeah, when that, when I, uh, the, the remark came up earlier about, uh, again, I was in government for 35 years, and actually it was in 2001, I led the campaign to release the NSA security guidance, which we developed for the DOD and the intelligence community, you know, as a, as a function of red team testing and that kind of stuff, uh, release it to the public through NSA.gov, the early days of sort of government stuff going on the web. And that gained us more credibility, more friends, and more Sort of relationships with the industry than anything else we could have done. You know, I had to convince bosses that the, the world was changing, right? Open source and you know open standards that you get more ability to be part of the environment by giving stuff away than you try than you do by trying to be, retain control of it, right? And, you know, as, as opposed to like setting up a unique government standard. So I sent lots of people out to in the industry to work with standards groups. Uh, a number of the early um, um, security standards and security automation were written by folks that, that worked in my group and that, that kind of a thing. But the idea was to be involved in a lot of these activities directly, right? Bringing people, you know, smart people, a lot of great people work in government, but if they're heading behind concertina wire, then, then you know, it's easy to treat them as those government guys don't know what they're doing. So for me, that was uh, bringing a lot of openness to that. A lot of that got undone, frankly, for lots of, of, of current event kind of things over the last few years. I think the common wisdom among my industry friends is that the government's been absent from a lot of activity uh, around the world and standards bodies. Uh, Larry mentioned 5G. You know that um, if you're not there, then you're not shaping the the discussion, right? So you have to be out there. And again, people, when you show up and you say we're the government, we're here to organize you, people aren't interested anymore. That's just not the way this this flows. You have to think of this as you know we we come out as participants, right? We bring smart people with big ideas and uh, documented thoughts and so forth around that. So, so that was for me, again, sort of a, a uh, as I shifted from government, you know, the whole model of CIS is we create stuff through volunteers and we give it away. Uh, you still have to, a company to run and we support it through a membership model, but it's, it's this idea that the greater good is best served by this free availability of content. And, you know, not everybody can pull that off, but we're, we're lucky enough to be in a space that allows this to happen, which then creates partnerships and friendships and opportunities to create new things. Thank you. Great, Larry. Sorry, as I'm mute. First of all, I have the I say it's the same model that Tony has, and it does work. Um, just quickly on that, uh, I think that uh, what Tony is talking about, and what I was alluding to before, we need to fundamentally alter the thinking. We have to rethink how we're doing these things, and we can do these by uh, industry, government consortia that are much more equal. Uh, we we did this with NASA. <laughs> we did this with uh, Semitech. Uh, by the way, that's largely how CMMA was developed. Um, is they had a much more egalitarian structure with co-chairmanships uh, and an equal number of industry and, and DOD people sitting around the table uh, working out what CMMA was. So this kind of stuff can be done. Um, so uh, I, that's the direction we need to go to. Uh, with respect to uh, really critical infrastructure, I'm not positive exactly what we mean by really critical infrastructure. Super critical. And seems to be pretty critical, but it's really different. I suspect you're talking about utilities. Not restaurants. I'm not talking about the food sector. So I have always been um, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the end where I thought, yes, these are very low level uh, threats, uh, taking down the telecom system or taking down the electric grid. But the reason was economics. 
So the Russians and the Chinese have for a decade or so been able to take down the telecom system or the economic or, or, or the, uh, the electric grid, but they wouldn't do it because their economy is interconnected to our economy. If you crash the electric grid uh, in, on the East Coast in, 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 uh, in, in winter, which was fantasized back in the, you know, the days where there are these regulatory bills floating through Congress, um, that would have crashed the US economy, which would have crashed the Russian economy and crashed the Chinese economy, which would have crashed their political systems. So they weren't going to do it. They don't want to take down these <laughs> major infrastructures. They want to use them. The Chinese don't want to take down the, the internet. They want to use it. They're making tons of money off it. And so are all the criminals. Now to get to how do you deal with these things and, and, and do the, uh, the, uh, the more traditional, for example, the crime prevention, uh, cyber techniques, will they help? Yeah, you motivate people in their self-interest to harden their systems, follow good uh, documented um, uh, 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 hygiene uh, and, and mitigation devices by putting in risk assessments that are modern risk assessments that do these in an economic fashion and they will harden the systems and that hardening of the system that defends them against sophisticated cyber crime attacks. And by the way, the cyber crime attacks are just as sophisticated as the nation state attacks um, at, the, at the high end. Um, and if you're hardening against the cyber crime attacks, you're similarly hardening against the nation state attacks. They're pretty much the same thing at this stage. A lot of the cyber criminals used to work for the nation states. <laughs> they now contract, went into business for themselves. Um, so, so that's the answer here, is that we have to reach people's mutual self-interest, make this economic for all of us. It's in all of our self-interest. And remember, we're losing tons of money by not doing this. You know, I, 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 the estimates, Taylor's of course right. I mean, is it $10 trillion or is it $5 trillion? Doesn't make that much difference to me. <laughs> it's tons and tons of money, huge drag on the economy. We'd be much better off if we just invested in this. And we don't invest in cyber, cyber uh, security at all. We're trying to do this on the cheap. Remember, we're spending $450 million on the FBI to follow a trillion dollar cyber crime. The Chinese are spending a trillion dollars on the digital Silk Road, and they're spending a whole bunch on top of that. And we didn't get to it, but they're, they're crushing us worldwide. They're making friends and influence people. This is a, a digital Marshall plan, you know, and, and they're, they're winning. Um, so we have major, if you want to be, you want to be concerned about the threats to the United States, that's our major threat is that they are turning over the, the Western world order to try to put Chinese currency as the dominant currency and they're 20, 30 years away from being able to do this. And I take it from some bullets on the panel that you don't believe me. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I'm sounding, it's, it's sounding like if we asked you about Chinese American relations, we would probably get an answer that was even below your 1.5. You mentioned, so let, me, let me ask jo Joel, if you would take a swing at um, Scott's question and, and any others. Uh, yeah, you want to weigh in on that. Um, uh, I don't agree with Scott's premise, um, or at least perhaps we haven't been clear about it. Uh, Scott writes that our discussion has largely been informed by economic cybercrime. Uh, really, um, not only because of what Larry just said, that the, the cyber hardening against cybercrime hardens against other things, but um, let, let me give you an example of, of, of something that has nothing to do with necessarily with cybercrime. Um, electricity in the United States is governed uh, by the federal government only at the interstate transmission level. And it's governed by public utility companies and state law at the generation and distribution levels. Um, the public utility commissioners are in very politically sensitive positions. Security has to be paid for but raising rates is politically difficult, especially politically difficult when lots of people are suffering and uh, can't make ends meet now. And yet security has to be paid for. So there's lots of rooms in a place like this for incentives of several kinds. Some just outright subsidies perhaps. Uh, another might be using the federal regulation, ability to regulate transmission as a lever into um, um, utility operations at the distribution generation level. I, I, I think that would require people who would do this as for a living um, to figure out 
the details of that. I, I can't, but I, I'm pretty sure you, we could do that. Um, so we're talking, uh, Larry's been talking, if I can speak for him for just a second, although he speaks well for himself, um, and uh, uh, Mark and, and Tony, the, the incentive issue goes way beyond the cyber crime problem. It has to do with, um, uh, with, with critical infrastructure and businesses in general, not only in, in investment, um, but um, it, so I, really we're talking about incentives, both legal negative incentives and uh, positive incentives that have not, not just about cybercrime. By the way, Jack, I, didn't, I don't say that, I, I put regulation at the bottom of that list, uh, not at the top of that list. Um, in, a, in a capitalist economy, regulation is much less important as a driver of behavior than tax, um, positive incentives, and liability. That, that's where I think we need to go. I, I hope that clarifies our position for Scott. Sean, I, I'm going to turn it over to you for, uh, I guess, final question and then um, any benediction you want to offer, because I, I know we have to wrap up at 3.30. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, so one of the questions, and this was probably more geared toward uh, Mark since it's a cyber solarium based question, but I, I think uh, the rest of the group might have some insight into it too. Um, and so in reading the cyber solarium uh, report, the three pillars are focused on uh, normative building. Um, so mostly a diplomatic uh, function, um, building resilience where I think that fits mostly the discussion we've had here, which is a, a lot to do with public private partnership and building collaboration and those sorts of things and, and uh, incentives to, uh, building as well. Um, and then the third is imposing costs, which tends to focus on military uh, related actions. Um, and but it, the question is, is those first, the, the first and the third, the building norms and imposing costs, there's not a lot of emphasis on public private partnership there. Um, but I think in reading and talking to folks that there is space for that, or at least, uh, uh, you know, the beginnings of, of working together on those two parts. Um, and an example would be, you know, Microsoft, or I think Siemens both have initiatives to try to build some more normative uh, developments, um, maybe frustrated with government efforts. Um, and in the cost imposition, uh, you know, if the military is to impose costs in, in a, like a defend forward type strategy, uh, that takes some knowing about the, the private sector side and what they're defending. Um, so I was wondering if folks could speak to that a little bit. Maybe, maybe Tony, you want to start. Yeah, and I'm not sure where to go with that, Sean, but I mean, I think the point is that I think there is plenty of room for, you know, figuring out things like, uh, uh, um, you know, people want to partition this problem neatly into critical, non-critical, government, non-government, and I just think that doesn't make any sense. You know, there's too much overlap, there's too much mixed use, you know, and like in the DOD, right, we never go to war without our friends. The complication is that we don't know who our friends are until we go to war. And, you know, so you're, you're always, you always have to think of this as a composition problem. Uh, with, and so you, you know, when people say critical, there's an implication that everything else doesn't matter. My, my view is completely the opposite of that. Everything matters, some things matter more. Everything deserves some level of protection. Anybody that does a risk assessment that says, this part of my infrastructure is not critical, so I don't have to worry about it, is, is gonna make a mistake. That's just guaranteed to be wrong. So whether it's public or private, to me, uh, you know, you have to think of it as a, as a whole. And then therefore, you, you need to create those, uh, both the practices, the incentives, and the sort of management machinery as, as a whole. Yeah, I have thought on this. Uh, one aspect I think of what Sean, you were raising is, uh, has to do with our, our deterrence policy or more accurately, our utter lack of one uh, and the imposition, our inability so far to impose significant costs on people who attack us. I, I believe that, um, the Solarian Commission was, was right about this in, in two respects. One is that in the United States, we have no choice but to look at the deniability aspect of deterrence policy. We must harden our targets. But we have absolutely relinquished up till now, up till recently anyway, the um, intention of imposing costs, that's to say punishment, to, to be frank about it, on people who attack us. And, and this is just an absolutely losing proposition. I think that the uh, cybercoms 
defend forward policy or its persistent engagement policy is fundamentally correct. The difficulty for those of us who are now on the outside, but Tony and I used to be on the inside, um, is that unless you have, you don't really know, understand what they're doing, except in a few cases where they tell you, uh, unless you can see the target list. Uh, and we can't, and, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't. But um, we cannot sit by and allow people to attack us without smacking them back, short of, and I'm talking about smacking them back in non-kinetic fashion, non below the level of armed attack um, as defined in the law of armed conflict. So I, I think this is a, a very important part of what we have to do. And at the same time, I think the fundamentally most important part of our deterrence policy must be hardened, becoming a much harder target. Yeah, I would agree with, with Joel's comments in that regard, although I will confess I have not figured out the proper way to do cyber deterrence in this uh, particular sense. So that's for greater minds. I would associate myself with uh, Tony's comments. I uh, am not, uh, notwithstanding uh, and with all respect, uh, I'm not a big fan of the designations of critical uh, infrastructure with respect to cybersecurity because the fundamental uh, definitional quality of the internet is interconnection and interdependence. So in, in one of our books that we did for the Association of Corporate Directors, we had this example of this highly important secure facility, this element of critical infrastructure uh, that was doing a real good job with security. Um, and then the bad guys found out that at, uh, at lunch, uh, the employees at this facility like to use a local Chinese restaurant. And so what the bad guys did is they loaded the malware onto the online menu at the Chinese restaurant and through there got into the, so now Chinese restaurants become part of our critical infrastructure. The interdependency of the, so we need a whole of system sort of solution, which is much, much more difficult, I understand. I think the whole critical sector thing is really a holdover from physical security. Um, I, I don't think that we have, you know, we don't have critical assets in cyber. We have critical functions. And, and let me tell you, it was a long fight with DHS 10 years ago to get the, when we were in the ITSCC, the IT Sector Coordinating Council, and we had to do a, a sector specific plan. And they want us to identify our critical function, our critical assets. And we said, no, we don't have critical assets. We have critical functions. My point being, we have to rethink all of these things. We are holding over a bunch of ideas from the last war that I think are impeding us from moving ahead into the digital age. And we are, we really don't have anybody in government doing that. We don't have, we don't have an office where they're in charge of what we would call an industry digital transformation. You know, what are we going to do in the digital age? How do we look different? How are we going to process, et cetera? And I think a lot of these things, for example, deterrence, you know, would be located there. Obviously the DOT guys are involved. But I mean, I think we have to think about this in a 21st century model, and I don't think we are doing that completely. I, I think, I suspect we have to uh, wrap up. I'm getting the greasy eye from Sean, so I'm surrendering uh, my role as moderator and the microphone to him. Excellent. Yep, uh, we are definitely um, over time now. So uh, I think it's probably just appropriate to say thank you uh, to all the panelists, uh, Tony, Larry, Mark, and Joel. Thank you uh, for taking the time to, to have this great discussion and sharing your thoughts. Um, thank you too to the Center for National Studies team uh, for putting this together, uh, Michelle and Lauren, thanks. Uh, as well as the Internet Policy Research, Research Initiative, uh, Cybersecurity at MIT Sloan, and then Cyberpolitics at MIT for supporting. Um, and then finally, thanks to everybody uh, that uh, has joined the conversation. Uh, greatly appreciate it and I hope it was useful for you.